let's give it up for Jesus this morning. You know, here this morning, the Bible tells us that if we believe in God, if we put our trust in him, that he calls us his adopted sons and daughters. And that is just such awesome news this morning because we are who God says that we are, not who the world says we are, not who uh, anybody else beside us or around us says we are. We are who God says we are in his eyes. We are his sons 
and his daughters. Let's just continue to lift our eyes to him here this morning.
Awesome. You can go ahead and have a seat today. I want to read a verse here from Hebrews. It says this, Hebrews 13, 15. It says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And, you know, I was reading through this verse, and uh, it just kind of struck me why the author here chose to say a few words that he did. He could have easily just said, give God praise, do good to others, because this is what's good. But instead, he said, to offer God a sacrifice of praise, to do good, to share with others, because with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And so that just caught my attention. Why is he using the word sacrifice here? And, you know, I realize when we come in today, um, and I hope your week was great, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to worship God when things are going well, right? When you got a promotion, um, when you paid off, uh, say, some debt, when you got, uh, you know, that all your kids are healthy, everything's good at your home, your, uh, the kids' grades are good. It's easy to come in here and say, God, you are awesome, and to praise our God, and we absolutely should because everything good comes from our Father. But I also realize that a lot of us come in here and we might have lost a job. We didn't get that promotion that we were expecting. Your car broke down. Your kids were screaming. They're all sick. And life is just hard and it's tough. And this is where we have to give God a sacrifice of praise because it's not easy just to come in here and lift our hands and say, God, you are good. But God is always worthy and he is always good because of what he did for us on the cross. So there are times in our lives when we have to give God that sacrifice of praising him, of lifting our hands to him, even in the midst of chaos to say, God, you are good and I will yet trust in you. And to do good to those around us because it doesn't just stop there, but, but we go out of these four walls and we do good to those around us and we share the love and show the love of Jesus because he gave it all for us. And that's what we remember here this morning. We're gonna take communion together and we take this piece of bread, we take this cup of juice representing what Christ did for us on the cross because everything changed through the cross. God gave us salvation through Jesus. So this morning, we're gonna continue to sing, continue to worship. The guys are gonna come pass those out and you can take those whenever you're ready. Uh, But this morning, let's just offer God a sacrifice of our praise, a sacrifice of our praise to him.
We can go ahead and have a seat, and we're going to do a baby dedication right now. There's nothing more awesome than this. So we're going to have our Kids Zone director, Amber, come on up. She's got a few words for us. Hi, guys. Welcome to our baby dedication service. Baby dedication is such a biblical step. We're here today to follow the example set by Jesus' parents when they dedicated Jesus. They understood this passage. It's Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. You must de- uh, commit yourselves to... Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I knew this was going to happen. You must commit yourselves to these commandments that I set before you today. Repeat them over and over to your children. Talk about them when you're at home. Talk about them when you're on the go. Talk about them when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. In Luke chapter 2, it describes what they did when they dedicated Jesus, and it defines what we're doing here today. Um, We are, as we dedicate our children, we are presenting them back to God. Um, Just as Jesus' parents dedicate or presented Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem to fulfill the law of Moses, we present our children today in front of God and this church. Um, we are praising God for them. We are just thanking him for the blessing of children, um, the next generation to pass the gospel to the world, um, just as Jesus was praised for being the savior of the world. Um, and we're passing on a generational blessing. Um, just as Jesus was prayed over, we pray over the children today. Um, in Luke 2.40, it says this about Jesus. The child grew strong and healthy, He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. Um, So we pray that over the children today as we dedicate them. Um, I will call your names, and if you guys can come forward and stand on the stage, and then Pastor Greg will come up and pray over us. Um, Sam and Katrina Appel with their son, Clyde Jamison Appel. And Tim and Christina Ravencamp with their children, Jackson Ravencamp, Colton Craig Ravencamp, and Caden Ryan Ravencamp. Come on up. Let's get over. You guys want to keep down just a little bit? Let's make room for everybody. Thanks. That's perfect. All right, and then Daryl and Kelsey Standifer and their daughter, Harper Estelle Rose Standifer.
All right, and then Robert and Kendra Sayas with their son Kiawe, Kiawe, sorry, Sayas. One of the things that we do is uh, when, when we are praying over anybody, and especially these parents as they're embarking on raising these kids in the Lord, just like Jesus was raised in the Lord, we pray that they, they need some help, right, <laughs> from all of us. So one of the things that we do is uh, we kind of lay hands. It's symbolic of God passing his blessing on. And, and as you can tell here, we got a lot of kids. And this is one way we call our church a family. And this is one way where you guys can help. I mean, you might be called to serve in the children's department. You might be called to serve in the youth department. And you will be able to have contact with these kids. So we want to pray as a church body. We want to pray as parents and ask God's blessing upon these parents because parents, listen, if you raise your kids without mentioning Jesus, without mentioning God's commands, you're just having an exercise in futility. They're going to grow up and not know any of that. So do you vow today, I will raise my kids in the Lord. Just say, I do, if that's you. Amen. Church family. If you will assist, if you will pray for these families, if you will think of these families and just go to God on their behalf and, and the input that you have, would you be willing to be faithful to teach the next generation the ways of the Lord? If so, say, I will. Amen, amen. amen. So let's pray right now for these families and children. Father, we thank you so much for being able to be a part of these children's lives. Father, for these parents, for the daunting task of being able to raise this next generation and knowing you, for they will be those who carry this gospel message to the world. Father, I pray that you would give encouragement to these parents as they go before you and beseeching you on behalf of their children, that they would teach uh, during the day as they're walking along the road, as they lie down at night, the message your message to them, that they would know the way of salvation. Protect these little feet, these little hands, these little minds, that they would grow in you and find favor in you. Father, I pray for this body, our family, that they would have that input as well. Give us encouragement this day as we dedicate these, these children as Jesus was once dedicated at the temple. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, parents. My name is Lisa. And I'm Andrew. We have some great events coming up in the next few weeks we want to tell you about, as well as some different ways you can get involved and not just come to church, but be the church. We would love for you to become a part of this church family and find a place where you can belong. You can do that by attending the Belong class on March 31st. This is a 90-minute class right after the second service where we will go through the history, vision, and beliefs of Oasis Church, as well as find different areas where you can serve. Lunch and childcare is provided. Easter 2019 is right around the corner. What a great day to invite your friends, family, and neighbors to church. We'll have invite cards out in the lobby for you to hand out. There will be three service times on Easter at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. Kid Zone classes will only be held for the 10 and 11.30 a.m. service times. So make plans to join us as we celebrate our risen Savior together. This summer, we are sending our students to camp. Summer camps can make a huge impact on your kids' lives. This year, our elementary and high school students will be doing fundraisers to help cover the cost of going to camp. They will be selling breakfast burritos, baked goods, spaghetti dinners, and holding a car wash to raise money. You can help by bringing a little extra cash the next few months to support them and eat some delicious food. If your kids would like to go to camp this year and get involved in fundraising, please email the church or check out our website to get more information and register.
Thanks again for joining us today. After all, church is not just a place to come to, but a family where you belong. All this info and more can be found on our website at theoasiscc.com. And make sure to follow us on Facebook so you can stay up to date on everything going on around here. We hope you have a wonderful day. Morning, church. <laughs> Great to see everybody. We want to welcome one and all. And uh, just to let you know, we, Easter is coming up. And on the way out, you will get uh, like invite cards where you can invite your friends. People are just waiting to come to church and to hear the gospel. So on your way out, make sure to grab some of those cards and pray for those people that you would, uh, God would have you invite. And we're also asking, we're having three services. So if um, what we're asking is if you can attend the early or the later service, that would be advantageous because the middle service is usually it tends to be the really packed service. So let's plan for that and be in prayer for the, the Easter Sunday where we can celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today we begin, uh, we launch a brand new four-week message series on the life of the Old Testament prophet Elisha. Elisha, who, who, who had an outrageous kind of a faith. And really what I believe will happen over the next course uh, of the next four Sundays is I really believe that God is going to inspire some of you to have a defining moment in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And really what I want over the next four weeks to happen is for these, this message series as we're reading God's word for God to give to you an outrageous kind of a faith. Now, if you're a little bit old school, I'm using outrageous in the good sense. Now, I don't know if, if you've ever thought about this before, but there are a lot of words we use today that have double meanings. They have the regular meaning and they have another meaning, right? Like the word bad, like bad's bad, but bad can be good when it's like, that's bad. So that's bad, right? The word sick is like that too. Like sick means sick when you say, you know, that was sick because you vomited on me, like that's sick. But sick can be cool when you go, that's sick, right? That's sick, because so that can be cool. Outrageous is kind of the same way, and we're using it in the good sense. And when we're looking at this story of Elisha, he had an outrageous kind of a faith, and that's what we're going to look at over the course of the next several weeks and allow God, I pray, to develop within us that outrageous kind of a faith. So let's begin uh, to have your outlines there. We're going to uh, look at the context of 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're going to talk about who Elisha was we're going to look at the scripture. We're going to see what it has to say and where we're going in this series. And then we're going to apply some principles to our life. Uh, so this guy, Elisha, he had a, a mentor named Elijah. And a lot of people get Elijah and Elisha confused. And you might listen to me because I might outrageously say Elijah instead of Elisha. So let me know if I say that at the end of the service today, right? But Elijah was this great prophet of God. He was going to be the mentor of Elisha. And, and Elisha was actually going to give a double anointing of, of, of the anointing of God on his life that Elijah had. And Elisha is a prophet in the Old Testament. He did more miracles than anybody else in the Bible except for that of Jesus Christ. Now, when you're looking at the Bible as a whole, there were three primary, primary eras when uh, God did outstanding miracles. One of those eras had to do with the time frame of Moses and Joshua. The second was with Elijah and Elisha. The third epic was, uh, was when Jesus came and walked on this earth and did all the miracles too. But what's interesting about this Old Testament prophet, Elisha, he was, he was an ordinary guy. He was not the son of a priest. He was not a monk. He had no dramatic, outstanding demonstrations of faith. He was an ordinary guy who lived at home with his parents, and he was a farmer, and he plowed in the fields 
when God called him to do something extraordinary. Now, when did he exist? He existed and lived in the ninth century BC when Israel was under a divided kingdom. There was a lot of chaos in the land. A lot of God's people were worshiping the false god Baal. That's when God comes and takes this ordinary guy, and we're going to see an outrageous commitment of faith on behalf of Elisha. So let's read the scripture Then we're going to go back and look at it again verse by verse and pull out some applications for our life today. So 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 19, we read this. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. He himself was driving the 12th pair. Then it goes on to say that Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will will come with you. And Elijah says this back. He says, go back. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. And then get this, get this. He took, Elisha took his yoke of oxen. This is crazy. He slaughtered them. It even gets more outrageous. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. And then it says, it was at that time that he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Somebody say, that's the beginning of an outrageous story. That's the beginning. That was kind of outrageous, the way that you said that right there, right? So uh, let me tell you where we're going to go in this series. Next week, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about this miracle of God when Elisha had some people in a valley dig some ditches to hold water long before any rain was predicted because God was going to illustrate that we are to dream big. We're to dream big, even though we got to do some small things in order for God to do some big things. In the third week, what we're going to do is look at a widow who was desperate. And for any of you who are going through desperate times, Uh, and you're thinking, how in the world I'm going to make it? We're going to look at this miracle uh, that was done in the life of this widow. She was about to lose her two sons. All she had was this small jar of oil, and all she could see is what she didn't have. But Elisha was going to work a miracle in her life through the power of God and show her that all she had was all that she needed in order to serve God. In the fourth week, we're going to look at this crazy, outrageous miracle where this axe head flies off the handle. The prophet Elijah makes it float. This axe head floats. And what we're going to look at there symbolically is that many of us have kind of lost our passion and sharp sharp edge for God. And we're going to look at that story and apply it to our life and see how God can bring back uh, our commitment of faith and and apply that to our lives where we can get our spiritual edge back. So that's where we're going in this series. And today I want us to look at this outrageous commitment by this prophet, this soon-to-be prophet, Elisha. So I'm going to go back to verse 19. And, and look at that. And in the middle of the verse, it says, uh, shows us what Elisha was doing. Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. So what we're going to observe here, that Elijah, Elisha is doing the same thing day after day, week after week, year after year, and he's working on his parents' farm driving a yoke of oxen. Every day he's doing that. And the question that I want to ask you is, can you imagine the monotony of plowing behind a yoke of oxen day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year? I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, just think about what would you smell? It'd be something sick and that would be in the sick scent. You know what I mean? And, and, and what would you see if you're walking behind oxen every day? Now, be nice about that. You would see oxen rears. Day after day after day, oxen rears. And if you can't really envision what I'm talking about, check out this picture. Now, that would be, that would be bad in the, the regular kind of sense, right? That's what you're doing day after day. Now, some of you might feel a little bit like Elisha this morning, right? Because day after day, week after week, you're doing the exact same thing. And it's like, could it be any more monotonous than it is right now? And and like you're stuck in a job, right? And you're seeing the same coworkers that you're working with. And you're like, you know, I feel like I'm standing behind some oxen rears. (laughs) Don't call your coworkers oxen rears, but that's the way you feel because you're stuck in this job day after day, right? Some of you might be in sales 
And it's like, you know, you strive all week long to reach this, all month long to reach this quota. You reach it, and what do you got to do? You got to do it all over again. You're going, could it be any more monotonous? I mean, I'm trying to change the world, and it's the same thing month after month after month. Some of you might be students, and it's like, what am I doing with my life? I'm going to school, I'm working to pay the bills. I'm going to school and I'm working to pay the bills, right? It's like how more monotonous could it get? There's oxen rears everywhere. Some of you are parents of young children. What do you see all day long? Diapers and laundry and dishes. Diapers, laundry and dishes, right? And it's incredibly easy to lose your passion when all you see is oxen rears, if you know what I'm saying. I believe with all my heart, though, that Elisha, as he was being faithful in his task when God showed up, when you're faithful, even in the monotonous times of life, when you're faithful in the little things, God is going to reward you with greater things because he's going to trust you with greater things. Elisha, although this might not have been the favorite thing for him to do, I mean, it might have been physically draining. It might have been emotionally draining. But he was faithful in that task when God showed up and took Elisha from where he was to where he wanted him to be because Elisha was about to have an outrageous opportunity. Um, Let's look at this next verse. Later on in verse 19, Elijah then went up to him, Elisha, and threw his cloak around him. What's that mean? So Elijah, this prophet of God, took his mantle, took his covering, which was an animal skin, maybe it had fur on it, maybe it didn't, and he took it off of himself and he covered Elisha with it. What did that mean? That he, what Elijah was, Elijah was demonstrating was what God had mantled me with, I am now going to put it on you and God is going to anoint you with the blessing that I had and Elisha was going to be the student and Elijah was going to be the mentor. And he put this mantle on him, put his covering on him. And what I want to do with this story is I want to pull out a couple of thoughts, a couple of principles about how we can apply this story of this ordinary man who wanted to serve God in an extraordinary way, uh, how he had this outrageous faith. And I pray that it would grow our faith as well. So if you got your outline and you're going to fill in the outline there about what Elijah was about to do. He didn't know all the details. So the first thought that I want you to get is you don't have to understand fully to obey God immediately. You don't have to understand everything in the future for you to obey what God has for you today. So Elijah puts on this cloak around Elisha. And then what did he do? Look at verse 20. Elisha then left his oxen. And what did he do, everybody? ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. And notice one thing about this. Elisha didn't have to pray about it. Did a pastor actually say that? He didn't have to write a pro and con list. Well, this is the reason I should stay. This is the reason I should go. He didn't have to consult his counselor about that. All he did was, I believe this is God's call on my life. And with this outrageous commitment, he went and followed Elijah immediately. So you don't have to understand fully to obey God immediately. Now, I'd like to go down just a quick rabbit trail for just a moment for those of you who would aspire to leadership positions. When I first preached on Elijah, like 15, Elisha 15 years ago, I preached on leadership principles from Elisha. And and one of the things uh, that I've gotten as a question over the years, uh, pastoring the church is, hey, pastor, what's your five-year plan for the church? And I love strategic planning. I used to map everything out with strategic planning, and I would plan about what are we going to do, and it's good and it's wise to do that. But what I have found recently is that the world is changing so rapidly, the church is changing so rapidly, I cannot possibly predict what God is even going to do a year from now. But what I do want to do is I want to be ready when I hear the voice of God to be able to respond whatever he wants me to respond with in the present. So as a staff, we want to pray, pray and be ready financially for anything that might come our way. We want to be prepared and have margin and time, margin in our family for when God says something for us to do that we will be at the ready to be able to respond to the call of God. Now, I don't know how this would speak to you, 
but with all my heart, if, if you would be ready in a posture of spiritual readiness to hear the voice of God, you can't possibly plan for what God has a year down the road for you. But if you are at the ready, at the ready, when God calls, you will be able to respond immediately, even if you don't understand that fully. So I want to be able to say yes when God places that call on my life. And get this, God will rarely give you the details you get that? Rarely will God tell you everything in advance because you're like, God, give me details. And he's like, you can't handle the details because if I gave you the details, you wouldn't even show up. God is very spiritually vague at times, I think, when he calls us. Sometimes he just gives us one word and we got to respond to that. And I believe that God today might give somebody just one word and that's going to be all that you need in order to respond to the will of God and the call of God on your life. When you look at the Bible and see the scriptures, when God gave a lot of his people direction, he just gave them one word. I think of the life of Moses. He told Moses, go. He told Abraham, go. Go to the land that I'm going to show you. Peter is in the boat. Jesus is walking across the water. Peter's like, Jesus, can I? And Jesus gives him one word, come. And he walks on the water for a little bit, right? Before he sinks. But God gave them one word. Some of you might be positioned right now to hear just that one word from God. And I don't know what it'll be. And it could be with your marriage that you know that you're about to cash it in. You don't know how it's going to work. And God might give you that one word, stay. And you don't understand that fully, but you're going to hear that word and you're going to stay. It might be a health situation with you that's bad or negative or somebody with whom that you love and, and you're looking to God, what am I going to do? I don't fully understand that, but God's going to give you one word that's trust and you're going to obey that. You're going to trust his will. Some of you have like this, this idea. You got an idea. Maybe it's a business idea or ministry idea or book idea and you're going, God, what am I supposed to do with this? And you don't understand and God is going to give you one word and that word is start. Start right now. And you're going to obey even though you fully don't understand. Maybe you have been attending church and you are growing in your faith, but you've just been kind of observing. And God's going to give you one word because you're going to say, you know what? I want to be all in. And he's going to tell you, commit, commit. And you don't know how you're going to do it or what you're going to do, but you're going to respond and obey that word, commit to the Lord's will. You might be praying about the future of your family and you're going to hear one word, adopt, foster, and you're going to, I don't know how, what am I going to do? Domestic international, male or female. And God's going to give you that word. Look, do this, start, go now. You don't have to understand fully to obey immediately what God has in store for your life. There might be a single girl here, a single girl here today and you are dating a jerk and you know it and everybody else knows it. And God's going to give you one word and you're going to respond immediately. And that one word is break up with that jerk. You needed five words, <laughs> right? And you're like, what am I going to do if I don't have made a date? Who am I going to marry? What am I going to do? Listen, you can't marry a cherry Coke if you're dating a slushy. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but you know what that means. You don't have to fully understand to obey God immediately. I, mean, I, I think about just coming here to the Oasis Church some eight years ago. I, the position that I had at that time, I'd agreed to, to doing five years with a friend of mine who'd been at this church for 40 years to start preaching alongside him to make that transition happen when he retires. I had five years w to be able to do that. And uh, at the, nearing the end of that five years, I was starting to look for a senior pastor position, but we were living in northern Kentucky and we didn't want to move uh, from that area. We love that area. We looked at places really close like Southern Ohio. We had offers there, offers in Tennessee. Odd thing is we started talking to the Oasis Church, 1,200 miles away from where we lived. Well, we had been praying, God, watch your will, watch your will, watch your will. Well, in the last hour, a church from Lexington, Kentucky called. They were about an hour and 15 minutes from where we lived. That This church had everything that I'd been praying for. They had an incredible campus. The auditorium, the, the worship center was paid for. 
The activity center was paid for. They had about 450 people in attendance. They offered me the position. And all I heard from God was one word, no. And within 24 hours, I heard another word and answered the call here. And God said, go. And we ended up 1,200 miles away from our home. Why? Because of this outrageous call of God to be obedient to that one word in which he called us. Some of you are going to hear one word from God. He's going to say something. I don't know what it is, but, but, and you're going to obey. Even though you don't understand fully, you're going to obey and follow his will completely. So that's the first thought from Elijah's story that we can glean this morning. The second thought that I want you to get if you're taking notes, those God uses the most are those who hold on to the least. Those who God uses the most are those who hold on to the least. Look at what Elisha does in verse 21. It says, so Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen. This was his livelihood. This is how he made his money, his living. And look at what he, what did he do? He slaughtered them. He killed them all, killed them dead. And then look, look what he does with the plows. He, what did he do with the plows? He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. He built this big bonfire with all this plowing equipment. He said, here, have a steak. It's on me. And he did that, and it said, then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. This is outrageous. Through and through, this is outrageous. I mean, what's going through Elijah's mind? He's going, God's calling me. What do I do? Uh, this is crazy. Uh, maybe I'll become greater than Elijah. What should I do now? And he, he like kills the cows and he burns the plows. He's like, I'm gonna kill the cows and burn the plows. What was he essentially saying? He's like, you know what? There's no plan B. I'm gonna be, be obedient to God and I'm gonna follow plan A and I wanna burn everything in the past so I can follow God's call on my life. This is exactly what I'm gonna do. Now you can understand killing of the cows, right? I mean, because oftentimes in Scripture, when God set people out to do something and set apart, they would make a sacrifice. It was often, you may have heard the prodigal son story where the, 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 the prodigal goes off and he comes back and the father says, kill the fatted cow. Let's grill some steaks. How do you want them? Medium rare. There were no vegans in Jesus' day. So they partied. And you can, you can get how they, they killed the cows, Right. But burning the plows, I mean, had this been my kid, I'd have something to say about that, right? My kids come in and say, you know what? Hey, I want to follow Jesus. I'm just going to go. This is crazy, my faith. And I'd say, kids, look, that's all well and good, but hold off before you kill the cows and burn the plows. I mean, because you, you may need a fallback plan, right? I mean, that's what I, instru I would instruct my kids. You may have to fall back on something, but not Elisha. He knew that if he was going to follow God, he was going to have to burn some bridges in order to get there. And oftentimes, what you find in Scripture, when God puts a calling on your life, when God gives you a word in your life, that you've got to do something drastic in order to follow him. I, I think about Elisha here, killed the cows, burned the plows. But I think about when Jesus called his disciples. They had businesses. They had fishing businesses. They had tax businesses. And it is that time of year, so how appropriate is that? But the Bible says, what did they do? They had a, a kill the cow, burn the plow kind of faith because the Bible says that they left everything to follow Jesus, everything. And we can't gloss over that because they left everything, their home, their security. It would be like God putting that call on our life and we would leave that which we were trained for, that which we went to college for, that which we was raised in our parents, our home. We would leave that comfort to go follow you. They left everything just like Elisha. And there are some of you who God's going to call, and he's going to give you a plow-burning kind of a faith. Now, let me give a qualifier here. We've got to have this qualifier, right? Be sure that it's God who's speaking to you. Because you may not like your job, and so you don't walk in 
and you go, I quit my job because you don't like your job, and you go, I, I hate all these people, and you walk out and you burn the building in the ground, right? That's not what I'm talking about. You don't do that. Make sure that it's God, that you're hearing God, and you're convicted that it's God, and it could be nothing else but God, and you realize, you know what? This is plan A, and I've got to burn a bridge. I've got to have a plow-burning faith in order to get from where I am to where God wants to take me. And, I, and I'll just tell you a couple of stories of people who had plow burning faith. There was a fellow here who before the age of 50, he wanted to retire and he had an incredible plan. And he had this five-year plan, if you know what I'm talking about. He'd been in the military. Uh, he'd finished that up. He went into contracting work overseas and prayed, prayed incredibly well. And uh, he went over there. He, he protected diplomats and politicians when they were overseas. And this job play, play, paid phenomenally well. And he had happened to be home visiting. And uh, he had the next several years planned out that he was going to retire, pay his mortgage, uh, pay all the cars off, have an incredible nest egg for retirement. And he came in one morning, and I preached a sermon on your future. And I remember the day he came to me, and he said, Pastor, God said some things through that message, through his word that's, that I have decided is going to change the course of my life. And what did he do? He quit his contracting job because he wanted to spend more time stateside with his family. And you look at him today and he never looks back for that decision that he made to follow God's prompting in his life. I think about a young man who was addicted to drugs God rescued him out of that lifestyle, started coming to church, started getting involved. The problem was all of his friends were still in that addiction lifestyle. The temptation for him to go back into that lifestyle was so horrendous, but he had a plow burning kind of faith. He quit his job, moved to a different city to be with those of like mind faith, got another job, got a new set of friends because he knew his life was that valuable. He had a plow burning kind of a faith. Now, this next family, I don't know them personally, but I know about them. The, this family was on fire for Jesus Christ. They served everywhere in the church until it got about May. And then what happened in May? They, it, during May to September, they went to their lake house and they spent all summer because they loved it so, not serving God, but just enjoying their time at the lake until the nine-year-old daughter said to the dad, Dad, why is it that we love Jesus all year long, but we don't love him in the summertime? That changed that man, and he had a plow-burning kind of faith. He sold the lake house. He sold the boat because he wanted to demonstrate to his daughter with his lifestyle that we love Jesus all year long, we love Jesus, and he burned the plow. Would you say to the person sitting next to you, maybe you need to burn a plow right now? Now look at the person on the other side who was your second choice and say, maybe you need to burn a plow. <laughs> yes, some of you need to burn a plow. I do not know what it would be in your life, but whatever that is, you need to burn it to so that you can serve God. I mean, if there is a sin that is holding you back, you need to burn that plow. If, if there is a doubt that's it's in the back of your mind, you need to burn that plow. If there's a relationship holding you back from serving God, you need to burn that plow. You're not gonna let anything keep you from following Jesus Christ. And listen, you do not have to fully understand to obey completely. You do not have to understand everything to follow God completely. Some of you... I would venture to say, are like a little kid who's holding on to his blankie. I can't let go of my blankie. I can't let go of my blankie because there's security in the blankie. I didn't have a blankie, but I had Brownie the Bear. I love Brownie the Bear. <laughs> Brownie the Bear was so comforting to me. But I realized as I got older, I couldn't hold on to Brownie the Bear all the time. I still have Brownie the Bear to this day. He's in a box in the basement, but I still got him. But understand this, you got to get this. This might be the only reason that God brought you here this morning. To step toward your destiny, you've got to be willing to step away from your security. In order to step to and toward your destiny, you've got to be willing to step away from your security. And God might give you one word today. 
And you need to obey that even if you fully don't understand that. But you're going to hear the voice of God. You're going to remember the, the call of Elisha. And you're going to have an outrageous kind of a faith. And it's going to change your life completely. Last week, we had several baptisms. What's baptism demonstrate? Baptism demonstrates I'm going toward a new destiny, and I'm going to step away from that security. And I guarantee you, everybody who was baptized last week didn't understand fully what God has in store for them. But you know what? They were obedient to the call of God to be baptized into Christ, which demonstrates a dying to your old self and being raised in the newness and likeness of Christ to follow him, to allow God to take you from where you are to where God wants you to be. Check out this video and let's celebrate with them as we watch this. Um, how baptism means a new beginning, a new start. Um, ideas of, of God and Jesus have, have kind of changed a little bit and changed for the better, I believe. And so being baptized uh, today, I wanted to know for sure. I wanted to wait and be positive that this is what I wanted and not just because, you know, just because. And so I felt it. I felt ready. And all day today, I just, I felt happy and I felt the, the, the Savior near and it's just been an amazing day for me. Uh, baptism for me means that accepting my uh, Lord and Savior Jesus into my life so uh, I can wash away my sins. Like joining God and joining God and His family and it takes away your sins. To accept Jesus into my life and to wash away my sins. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. The Son of God. And I receive him. And I receive him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. stand this morning as we close in prayer right now with every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we worship you today and we thank you for this incredible story of outrageous commitment before you with Elisha responding to your call upon his life. Father, I pray today for every person here that throughout this series that you would stretch our faith, that you would grow our faith outrageously that even when it doesn't make sense in life, that we would trust you and obey you. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would do an incredible work in us. Father, I pray that we would respond when we hear your call. And Father, for those today who, who do not have that kind of a faith, and maybe they don't even know you, and, and they're, they're thinking maybe, you know, I don't even believe that stuff, or there's, there's lots of ways to a God or after all I've done, there's no way that a supreme being could forgive me. I pray, Father, there could be a million reasons why somebody is not taking that next step, that step of faith toward you. I pray that you would burn that bridge in their mind and hearts right now, that they would seek you and find you, and you would reel, reel yourself to them. Father, I pray to that end that we would all see you in heaven one day, that we, even through the mundane, that you would show up big time and take us from where we are to where you want us to be. And I pray that you would grow our faith to that point, that we would take our next step toward you today in Jesus' 
name we pray. And everybody who agreed said amen and amen. We're going to sing a final song as we lift up praise to the one who made it all happen to give us the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life, Jesus Christ.
Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. We pray you have a very blessed week. You'll see you back here next time.